This is a production of Cornell University. Okay, so um, don't hold it against me having got my PhD from Dartmouth, I, I guess an Ivy rival, but uh, I did actually, my first acceptance for my chemistry degree was from Cornell and I had to actually sit there and think about it. Um, I couldn't have lost either way. Um, thank you so much. This is such a treat to be able to share the story of where we've gotten to to date with this project. And really you can think about this talk in several different dimensions. You can um, focus on the interesting genetics that we uncovered because really we're just a bunch of Gregor Mendel instead of playing with peas, um, we're just playing with, with tomatoes because none of us are professional horticulturists. We just have curiosity. Or you can think about the concept of how we ran this project because we started this back in 2005 and really did use a citizen science approach, which is why when my book is finally done, I will actually title it the word that I invented, crowd breeding, because we used a crowd of people to breed tomatoes. Or you can focus, as I discussed the project on, what are some of the risks and the challenges that we encountered along the way? So I always like to start people off by sharing what my own garden is like here in Hendersonville. And we did garden and live in Raleigh for 28 years, and it was really hot and really humid and getting really crowded. So we moved to Hendersonville, which is any of you who know where Asheville is, it's about 20 miles south. So Trader Joe's is not too far away. My backyard is a septic field, so I have to grow on top. So all of my garden is planted in containers or straw bales and the results are excellent. However, this is what it looked like as of yesterday. Our season is extremely compressed here in Hendersonville because diseases really start becoming very present and aggressive in mid-August and beyond. So typically, my entire crop comes in between the first week of July and the middle of August. What you see here is healthy plants on the, on the left end are eggplant and peppers which handled the issues in our climate here much better than the tomatoes did, but it was a great season. So why did we decide to tackle this project anyway? Um, I really caught the heirloom tomato bug in the mid eighties. And when we moved to Raleigh and went to the farmer's market, we realized no one there was really carrying anything interesting tomato wise in terms of starts, except for things like German Johnson. So we started selling seedlings there right around 1998. And the most frequent question that people were asking me is, I love the concept of heirlooms, all of the colors, all of the flavors, but I don't wanna climb a ladder to pick my tomato. Um, I have to grow it on a deck or a patio or a driveway. So what have you got in terms of plants that I can grow in a five gallon pot and they taste great? And the answer at the time was not a whole heck of a lot. Um, there are determinant varieties, of course. The color range was pretty limited, but you had yellow taxi and you had the red Roma types, but the flavor and the diversity of morphology just wasn't there. And the other major phenotype of, of tomatoes the, in terms of their growth habit, the dwarfs were quite obscure and not many people even knew about them. And in fact, these were the five that were available uh, commonly available when we started our project. And most of them are from the 1800s, like Dwarf Champion, Golden Dwarf Champion, New Big Dwarf and Dwarf Stone were from the early 1900s. Tom Wagner created a really nice tomato with lime green salad, but never took it any further than that. And that was from the mid seventies. I like to collect seed catalogs. So in a way I'm a bit of a tomato historian and genealogist. And when I opened the page of the 1915 Isbell catalog and saw this depiction, new big dwarf, ponderosa sized fruits on dwarf champion vines. That means one pound tomatoes on three to four feet tall plants. And they described what they did. They crossed ponderosa with dwarf champion, created the hybrid. And then I assume they spent four or five years picking through the F2 and beyond to get this particular combination. So I met my friend online, Katrina in Australia who loved to do tomato crosses. And I had ideas for what we wanted to cross and we set upon this project. Katrina uh, actually came over to the US in 2009 or 10 to attend our Tomato Palooza event. 
where we gathered all of my tomato plant customers together and we would typically have 250 varieties, 250 people, we'd all get canker sores, ingest lots of Maalox because of all the acidity. But Petrina and I here are shown manning the dwarf tomato project table, the early generation finds that we were coming out with. And in a way, this is the punchline of the talk because this describes where we have been and where we are. And then the rest of the talk is describing how this all worked. But we formed this project in 2005 through a discussion. And in here we are in 2022. We started ratcheting it down a little bit in 2018 because it was getting out of control. But in that span of 17 years and counting, we have enlisted the talents of a thousand or more volunteers from all over the world in 50 states, in 25 different countries, and we have placed 145 stable open pollinated varieties in uh, various seed catalogs. And that has been re uh, really exciting. Now, the, the Australian US split happened maybe around 2014, 2015, when seed import laws became really onerous and Petrina and I could no longer share seeds back and forth. So she is doing her thing in Australia, and I'm still doing my thing with lots of people in the country. So here are the key project attributes. It's all amateur, all volunteer. Um, the project leads, either Katrina or myself, or maybe a few other people that like to do crosses, would make the crosses between an indeterminate and a dwarf variety. Um, the project leads would grow the hybrids, and then we would collect lots of F2 seed and distribute it around. We would make the decisions based on the findings in terms of what is a good lead and what is not. One of the things that our volunteers really like is if they find it, they get to name it. And we have tomatoes named for cats and dogs and flowers and birds and aunts and uncles and, and you name it. The new varieties, the new named varieties are released only when they are stable open pollinated varieties. So what we didn't want to do is put a lot of early generation material out to the public, which would then end up in seed libraries or the seed savers exchange with no name attached and no ability to replicate the results. The profits are for the, real, the releasing seed companies. So one of the things we decided, let's pick some seed companies that needs something to help them become visible. And we will essentially just have a quantity of seeds grown out by one of our volunteers, give them the seeds, and it could be 2,000 seeds or 5,000 seeds. The company would germ test it, package it up, look at our description, put a link to our website on their website, and that is how we got all of our varieties out there. So it's the seed companies that get to gain something from this. I told all of our volunteers right off the bat, this project is going to be a lot of fun, but the pay is terrible, as in zero. Um, but that's fine because we wanted to do something for space challenge gardeners, as you heard in the and uh, the beginning. And all varieties we pledged to the open source seed initiative because what we wanted is when people grow our varieties, we didn't want to put any limitations on their use for further breeding. So we've essentially just given these seeds to the gardening public or plant breeding public to do what they wish. And when we get to the page at the end where I look at risks and challenges, we'll talk a little bit more about that. So um, very briefly, how did we do this? We, I bought a veggie bee and it comes with a shiny black spoon and some tweezers. And um, we, at the beginning, decided the best way to, to get early clarity of our success in the crosses is to remove pollen from the indeterminate variety, that's the male. And then we would uh, pull the anther cone just before it's fully open and before it self pollinates from the dwarf variety. This really helps in terms of knowing if our project um, took right away. And I'll talk about that in a moment. We uh, dip um, the pistol, the, the style from the pistol into, and forgive me if my genetic terms become a little bit garbled. Um, like I said, I, I do this for the love of it and for the history and the stories and the flavors. Uh, I need to brush up on my specific genetic uh, terms, I'm sure. But you just dip into the pollen. And I like to uh, cut the sepals a little bit to, uh, as a, a fallback, but I always put a twisty tie 
when I make the cross. And then if the, if the ovary swells, you hope that you got in there and did the pollen before it self pollen and I put a little X on it. This is Petrina in Australia in her dwarf uh, R&D garden where she's growing um, lots of varieties close together to pack in as much as possible. Uh, we don't worry a whole lot about crossing because the bees have proven not to spend a lot of time low down in these plants. And we focus off the first set fruit on the plants anyway, because a lot of times when these plants blossom, the bees aren't around. And so, and it's a breeding project. So undoubtedly we're getting a little bit of crossing, but we're looking at growing things out to F7 or F8. So we're not worried too much about that. These are some examples um, in Raleigh of my setups for the year. And they look nice and neat early on, but what happens is these plants grow to three or four feet tall and they get heavy with fruit and you end up with a pickup stick, uh, pick stick situation after a while. But you can, again, get a lot of R&D done in a small amount of space. And this is what my um, driveway in Raleigh used to look like. The reason I grow everything in my driveway is because that's where the sun shone. And the place where I did have my hand dug garden, the trees grew to the point where the plants weren't getting the hours of direct sun they needed to be productive. So that it all went into my driveway. I retired. Um, I was lucky to retire from Big Pharma early enough to call this my office uh, when, I, when I'm still young enough now to be able to get around and tend all this stuff. But it's been a lot of fun. Hendersonville is much more rural and uh, it's just a different setup altogether. But I still have places where the sun shines and I put up pallets. And this area on the gravel driveway is where I do a lot of the comparative growing and the growing out for the dwarf project. So a little bit more about dwarfs. Um, the gene that causes the dwarf growth also um, seems to be linked to another manifestation, which was, is crinkling up the foliage and making it a very dark bluish green, which is actually very attractive. The early seed catalogs called this rugose, R-U-G-O-S-E. And in fact, the very first dwarf showed up in a seed catalog in 1850 called tomato de lait, D-E, capital L-A-Y-E, and it was a mutation that occurred in a different variety in a, ca in a castle garden in France. So from that, I think came pretty much everything else. But on the left is a regular leaf dwarf on the top and foliage from a regular leaf determinant or indeterminate on the bottom. And you can see how uh, the foliage gets crinkled up. And there are potato leaf dwarfs. And on the right, the dwarf version of potato leaf is on the top and the indeterminate version is on the bottom. Um, why we really like playing with the dwarfs. Um, so these are the three main types of plant habit. There, of course, is another one called micro dwarf, which are extremely short, and we, that's out of scope for us. But indeterminates, as we all know, take over the garden. Uh, this is me standing next, hello? Yeah. This is me standing next to Cherokee Purple in July. It's already eight feet tall. I'm six feet tall. Where's it going to go from there? Determinate plants in on the uh, top right form essentially a ball of tomatoes that all ripen in a quite concentric time. And that's fine if you're a canner. But there is uh, my view, and I've talked to Rob Johnson of Johnny's about this, the level of fruit versus foliage is almost so out of whack because they're so heavy yielding that they never seem to develop the truly intense flavors as indeterminates or dwarfs. I think of dwarfs as a subtype that grow at half the vertical rate of indeterminates, but fruit throughout the season until killed by frost. Um, so if your Cherokee purple grows to eight feet tall, your corresponding dwarf will reach four feet tall. And I've actually measured the growth of tomatoes and I've found that indeterminates when they really get kicking in are growing two to three inches a day and dwarfs are growing about an inch a day. So there is that half. And they're beautiful plants. These are three dwarfs sitting in five gallon containers. There is the potato leaf dwarf and the right front and a regular leaf dwarf and the left front. So um, dominant traits in tomatoes that we uh, learn just enough, some of this by trial and error, some of it of course by reading. Uh, indeterminate is dominant to dwarf or determinate. Regular leaf shape, the serrated edges is, is uh, dominant to potato leaf. Yellow skin color is dominant to clear skin. 
uh, red flesh color is dominant to yellow. I put orange there, but there seems to be a bit more complexity with orange dominance. We've had some surprises, but clearly red flesh color is dominant to green or white. Small fruit size is dominant, which has really affected our work on some of our dwarf families. Uh, round is dominant unless a heart is involved, in which case that partially comes through in some of the work we've done. And stripes and anthocyanins also partially come through. So it's been a fun drive. We use the dwarf as the female because the fruit grows on the dwarf plant, but you can then ripen a fruit, that fruit that you crossed, and it do a test germination that same year. And if your plants are indeterminate, you know the cross work because indeterminate is dominant. When you save those seeds, um, you grow out the hybrid and then you save seeds from it. And this is what we pass around and, and send our volunteers on dwarf hunting expeditions because in the F2, 75% of seedlings are indeterminate, 25% are dwarf. And I'll show you a picture that's really easy to spot even early on. If a potato leaf was apparent, 25% of those 25% will be potato leaves. So now as you start working in determinant traits, so variegated foliage, potato leaf, clear skin, yellow flesh, it becomes harder to find the combinations you want, but once you've got them, you've got them. Um, dwarf seedlings are very distinctive. They're half the height of the indeterminates. They have a thicker stem. However, it can take six to 10 generations to stabilize one of our new varieties. The reason that working with Australia was so great and we use Florida in the same way because they can get extra seasons in is we could bat it back and forth and we could get to an F8 generation in four years. Um, you can assume that none of us volunteers or few of us had greenhouses or things like that. So most of us were one season growers. You can see here, uh, this is a mix of types. The indeterminants are, uh, look at the cells front and back at the extreme right. And the indeterminants are in the back. The dwarfs are in the front. We've also noticed that the cotyledons on the dwarfs tend to be a bit more rounded, whereas the ones in indeterminants are a bit more elongated. And here you've got uh, probably Brandywine, one of my favorite varieties on the left, an indeterminate potato leaf variety, and one of our new dwarfs on the right, showing that half height thing. Uh, another view. And the dwarfs even show the different foliage type. It's starting to show their crinkling on the right. The one in the center is a determinant. I believe this is taxi. And the foliage of determinants looks pretty much the same as indeterminants. We achieve diversity quite quick. So when you do a project, you look for the proof of concept. Can we cross indeterminants with dwarfs? and find interesting dwarf varieties that show attributes of the indeterminants that we used? Absolutely. This is only from about 2007 or 2008. And every tomato on this table is from the dwarf tomato breeding projects, many of which were exceeding a pound. And when you start seeing a plant loaded up with 12, 16 to 20 ounce fruit, a three foot plant, you do have to give it some support, uh, emotional <laughs> as well as physical. An example of some of the colors um, that we're playing with here. This is one of our crosses of Cherokee chocolate on the left, which is one of my favorite indeterminants. We crossed it with dwarf Mr. Snow on the right, one of my favorite dwarfs. It's one of our ivory colored or white dwarfs. The F1 hybrid in the middle, this represents the Chalky family. We'll get about naming in a second. So the red flesh of Cherokee chocolate combined with the yellow skin of Cherokee chocolate created a scarlet red tomato. So dwarf Mr. Snow had clear skin and white flesh, both recessive genes that did not express in the hybrid. This is just a slight offshoot. Um, I've really taken to making crosses between my favorite indeterminate variety, heirloom varieties to see what happens with the flavor. Can I create even better tomatoes? So two of my top three tomatoes are Cherokee purple on the left, Lillian's yellow heirloom on the right, and I made a hybrid. The hybrid is in the middle, is one of the best tomatoes I've ever eaten in my entire life. And I'm actually playing around with the F2 generation this year just to see what I get. The ways that we learned about the partial dominance of heart and stripes, um, this is a striped indeterminate on the left, Don's Double Delight and a heart-shaped indeterminate Canselmo family heirloom on the right. The hybrid is on the bottom. It is faintly striped 
in slightly heart shape. So pretty interesting stuff. So when you do a project like this and we were developing dwarf tomatoes, Petrina thought of the Disney movie. Um, and so we had names for the families of our first set of dwarfs, sneezy, sleepy, grumpy, happy, bashful, dopey, doc. However, um, that's not enough names. And we now have 100 families. When we, create, when we cross an indeterminate with a dwarf, we call that hybrid the beginning of a family. And then all of the work from that cross is under the family name. And so already you see one of our uh, California uh, uh, crossers with a sense of humor named his cross Sleazy and Petrina named one Witty. We've gone all over the map with our families, uh, but these are the first ones. And you can see the component varieties. Most of these are um, existing dwarfs, Golden Dwarf Champion, Budai Torp, which comes from Europe. Um, it, we didn't have our own dwarfs to use as crossing partners. So we hoped that, and, and none of these are outstanding varieties to eat. So we hope that by crossing those known dwarfs with outstanding varieties like Green Giant, Stump of the World, and Carbon, and Cherokee Chocolate, we would get expressions of the excellence of flavor in some of our F2s. This is, for example, how we created Summertime Green, which is one of my favorite dwarfs. It is a regular leaf dwarf plant, four feet tall, that produces 16 ounce green tomatoes that are off the chart flavor-wise, and that originated from a cross between Golden Dwarf Champion and Green Giant. And that, we called that the Sneezy family. And we have 10 releases just from that family. They're all either green or yellow or white. They're either potato leaf or regular leaf, and they are all just outstanding flavored. So this is one of our first learning is that the intense flavor genes of Green Giant seem to completely overwhelm the average at best flavor genes of Golden Dwarf Champion and show up in almost all of our um, releases. Another thing we learned is to not expect much from your F1 hybrid. So if you cross a great tomato with these dwarfs, should your hybrids taste great? As we found, not really. And in fact, um, you can see these in the, in the top is Sneezy and Sleepy and Witty working to the right. They're all medium-sized, even less than medium-sized red tomatoes with the exception of a few. And the only ones that tasted really, really good were Sneezy in the upper left and Sleazy in the lower right. In fact, Sleazy was such a delicious tomato. This was New Big Dwarf Times Carbon. The tomatoes were uniform, oblate, one pound pink tomatoes with just an outstanding flavor. So we haven't gone back to do this, but some of these hybrids we created, people would buy these as hybrids because they're so delicious. However, it was in the growing out of the F2s that we found the treasure. So just to take you on a little bit of a travelogue through some of our favorites to show just some of the diversity and some of the potential of this project. Dwarf Sweet Sue came out of the Sneezy family. It's an eight ounce, bright yellow, sometimes a little pink blush. My wife's name is Sue. It's one of my favorite dwarfs, so that worked out well for me and her. Um, speckled Heart in the upper right, we use Speckled Roman in that to, to bring the stripes into the fruit. And that is an eight ounce, beautiful solid heart that has much greater use beyond just sauce because it is really delicious to eat and it's really, really prolific. Fred's tie-dye in the lower left is essentially what it looks like if you take a Cherokee purple and some green or gold paint and you paint tie-dye stripes on it. Absolutely outstanding. And one of Brad Gates' uh, wild boar, I think pink Berkeley tie-dye may have been used to introduce the stripes into this, crossing it with dwarf wild Fred, one of our purple dwarfs. And then we even discovered some colors we didn't know existed, the black orange, the orange tomato that with that withholds some of the chlorophyll. So with Cherokee chocolate and Cherokee purple, you have pink or red tomatoes that retain chlorophyll, which gives them a purple or a brownish cast. Uluru ochre is an orange tomato that retains some of that chlorophyll because Cherokee purple was used in creating this cross with the orange tomato elb. And it, the flavor of Uluru ochre is absolutely outstanding. 12 to 14 ounce, beautiful tomatoes. One of my favorite colored ones, this is from the Beauty family. And this used uh, Berkeley tie-dye 
with um, one of our dwarfs whose name escapes me, but we ended up with seven releases. We've got chocolate with green stripes and pink, this is pink with gold stripes, red with gold stripes, yellow with pink stripes, green with pink stripes. The problem with this beauty family is it's been really tough to absolutely nail down the colors. So we'll think we have it stable and we'll grow it a bunch and what we have a rogue plant in there, but it's been fun to work with and they're really delicious. We've taken to look in a little bit at paste tomatoes. So tiger eye is an orange paste that has that chlorophyll retention. And purple heartthrob is a, just a wild colored tomato that's heart shaped about eight ounces long, deep, deep crimson flesh, absolutely wonderful flavor. Now we found that when we cross Mexico midget, which is the tiniest of tomatoes, I, I, it's a pimpinifolium for sure. It's the size of a pea. We crossed that with summertime green, which I showed you, the one pound green. The hybrid was just a normal cherry tomato. So that tiny uh, genetics of Mexico midget played really strongly into the hybrid. And the F2 is unlocking. We have these in purple and pink, white, yellow, green, orange. So apparently there was just a great amount of genetic diversity. I actually think Mexico midget may be closely related to the wild ancestral tomato from uh, the west coast of South America. It, it was found growing wild by someone in um, the Texas-Mexico border and uh, given to someone in California, uh, Barney Lehman by his brother and Barney sent it to me. And Mexico midget is one of the most popular tomatoes I grow, but we now re have released a delicious yellow dwarf tomato, cherry tomato, Eagle Smiley on the right, whose flavor actually approaches sun gold. People really love it. Uh, we've used the tomato variegated to breed variegation into a lot of our varieties, and we're starting to release some of those. This is dwarf Walter's Fancy, named after my grandfather, Walter. The fruit is ivory colored. And um, we've used a little bit of anthocyanin in some of our varieties. This is one of Tom Wagner's anthocyanin cherries that was given to a friend, and she sent it to me. And I bred it uh, with an indeterminate, and we started down the road of creating some of these. My problem with the anthocyanin dwarfs to date, and in fact, almost all anthocyanin varieties that I've tasted, is I'm finding the flavor either unusual or a little bit lacking. So our project has yet to produce an anthocyanin shoulder tomato that we actually love. This year is an example because I grew. Most of my dwarf work this year was using a variety called Dwarf Mocus Plum, which is a little two ounce um, purple plum with a heavy antho shoulder. And I crossed them with some of my favorite indeterminates like Don's Double Delight, Lillian's Yellow Heirloom, Lucky Cross. This is the result. I grew out maybe eight F2s. They're really pretty. I've got brown plums and bicolored hearts and purple with antho, round and plum none of them have the flavor I'm looking for. So in a project like this, you also have to be willing to call it a dead end. And I ran into some dead ends. Um, I actually have some show and tells. This is dwarf strawberry lemonade. This is one of our recent dwarf releases. It's pink, it's smooth. This one's about eight ounces, absolutely delicious. And this is dwarf snake bite. Uh, these can go to 16 ounces. They've got a little bit of green shoulder, a little corrugation but really a, a nice form and very much we have created, uh, yes? Are you showing new slides? You, you're mentioning new varieties. Or are, are you actually holding a tomato? Oh, in? oh, oh, you know what I'm doing? I, I can see myself showing them, but what I'm gonna do is when we get to the end and the slides are done, I will do the show and tell. So thanks for that. This is, this is the first time I've tried show and tell in one of these. So forgive me for a tech glitch. Um, we'll move on. A project like this, you have to document. And there is a website called Tomatoville, which is set up as a P2P. And the owner, uh, Craig, allowed us to manage our project in here. So we created subcategories for all of our families. We, under each family, would, we could create discussion threads for all of our leads. And in those threads, we could put pictures. So this gave Petrina and I a bird's eye view into everything people were doing. The risk in that is, the owner of Tomatoville is not sure he wants to keep Tomatoville up. And at this point, he doesn't seem to be willing to have us extract all of our information. So this is a conundrum that we're dealing with. And even when we have a variety released, we would list the entire genealogy of that variety, who, um, who grew it, 
what the vial number was because I keep really, um, really, really disciplined notes on all of this here in Excel. So everything is cross-referenced by number into an Excel spreadsheet with the name of the variety, the family it comes from, the person who sent me the seed, the source vial that they grew it from, and then a full description. Um, there is a company that has decided to focus on these and sell all of our varieties. So uh, Dwarf um, Victory Seeds, right from the start, has wanted to partner with us. They introduced a lot of them, and now pretty much they're introducing all of our new releases. And they have a separate page set up where you can go and uh, look at descriptions and all. So now this is kind of, um, there's a few slides you wanna get into that are a little more wordy than I like, but they, they get into the nub of this project. How do we promote these? Word of mouth primarily was our publicity method. It was very much bottom up rather than top down. We just wanna put stuff out there and see what people thought of it. Uh, Victory, Southern Exposure, Sand Hill Heritage, and a few others were part of our initial releases. Uh, Fruition is in there, some really good smaller companies. Um, so our first release, releases were in 2010. And the other day I went and started Googling names of our varieties. For example, Tasmanian chocolate, 20 seed catalogs, and I didn't even do an exhaustive search. So this bottom up approach has worked. It's kind of, if you build it, they will come. Um, 2011, our release Sweet Sue is listed in a whole bunch of catalogs. So they are getting around just fine through word of mouth. And it's really up to the seed companies that offer these to decide in Instagram and Facebook, I'm sure had become really effective tools. This is the slide we need to talk about. The needs of the project, the risks and the challenges. I, in my old job at Glaxo, I was a chemist, but I also became a project manager. And I, I became keenly aware of how important data management is, um, project organization, follow through, discipline, stamina, all of those things that a lot of us lack. Resources are critical, especially consistent resources. So if we've used a thousand people all over the world, I could probably pick out the 25 to 30 that were the core volunteers that carried out 70 to 80% of the work. Adequate and consistent data collection. People will think something's a good idea in spring, but then when their big garden starts harvesting, are they taking all the pictures? Are they weighing? Are they saving seeds? Uh, the collaborative working tool, Tomatoville, came around at the right time and was structured beautifully for our needs, but its future existence is tenuous. The consistent return of seed samples, you end up doing a lot of hounding. And because we spread this project so big and wide and we're not doing it for the money, not getting a seed back, being delayed on a line was not a tragedy, but still that is an issue. The barriers to seed sharing between US and anywhere is the way it's starting to turn out. And it's understandable because places don't want for uh, diseases that can adhere to or embed themselves in the seed coats of tomatoes to, to be released in other areas where it's not existent. Here's the big bugaboo for me. We, we've left so much on the cutting room floor because of, we are all limited by the size of the gardens in which we could carry out our project. So sufficient space, populations to explore all the, the, not only the possibilities, but how stable our releases were when we sent them to the company. And here's two more, learning about our releases. I get so many emails saying, I'm gardening in Vermont, pick me out three dwarfs that will really do well for me, or I'm in Arizona. Um, could you name me an orange or a green dwarf that will do well for me? We don't know yet. We've released these to the world. All of our children are out there. We don't know how they behave. We don't know. And, and look at this last one. Initial focus of this project was on color and size or flavor, the morphological diversity, the things we could see and touch and taste. We don't know what the various disease tolerances or susceptibilities are for these. And at best, they're anecdotal, where I've grown a bunch of them out hey, summertime green really seemed to go down to disease. Was it just that season? So there is potential future work. People can take these and try, if they love them, they can breathe disease tolerance and resistance into them. Um, I'm gonna do show and tell in a second and take questions. Katrina has a Dwarf Tomato Project website up. I'm gonna show links in a moment. 
uh, these are my two books. And anybody who's interested in them can, uh, can email me and we can work that out. I am here doing this. I'm gardening because my grandfather and dad embedded the love of gardening for me. So all of you, grow a gardener, grow your gardens, but find other people. We, this, I think gardening is going to save the world. So we have to do this. This is uh, my website. I can send this so you can have it distributed. It's my website, my email. Uh, until last Thursday, I was in my driveway doing Instagram lives every for 45 minutes every Thursday just to take questions and take people on tours of my garden and Petrina's website and Petrina's email and take a picture of the screen if you want. Um, I asked Petrina, uh, it, so this is a collaborative list of what our favorite dwarf tomatoes are and the ones that are bolded, this just flavor, the ones that are bolded we both love and then the ones that I have my name after, I particularly love, and the ones that her name is after, she particularly loves. Um, I, you know, I kind of go through this. I'm not sure how we're doing on time, but it was, it's always a great joy for me to share what we've done. And I just hope that all of you found something just a little bit interesting. I sparked an idea, uh, you know, something that you may want to get in touch with me about that I can help you with to take this in a different direction. But it's, I'm not stopping gardening anytime soon. Uh, my sabbatical that I'm taking from social networking largely is to finish writing the book on the Dwarf Tomato Project. At this point, I'm going to think I'm thinking of self-publishing it, but I'm in discussions with a few other organizations to see if they want to collaborate on it and give me a hand on that. But that's kind of what I have to say. And thanks for your attention. Great. Yeah. Nice talk. And oh, and and here we go. So <laughs> let's. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. this is snake bite. And you can see where it, this is 10 ounces. It's a smooth pink. It has got a lot of the attributes of heirlooms and being um, green. Oh, I got to remember, I'm going backwards to my camera, green shouldered. And this is the beautiful variety, dwarf strawberry lemonade, um, almost has the flavor of a brandy wine, really super productive. So you get your eight to 10 ounce slicing tomatoes on a four foot tall plant. And those are grown by my friend Adam. And I got them during a beer yesterday. We met at a local pub and he brought them to me and I figured I could use them today. So there you go. <laughs> yeah, so very nice. I mean, so much uh, genetic variation and so many unknowns. Maybe you can collaborate with Cornell Research, right? In the future, I mean, that would be awesome, right? Okay, so yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I met, I actually met Mike at, um, the organic seed meeting in Corvallis two years ago. I think Mike, I forget his name, begins with him, Mike Matichak, yeah. Um, and he and I talked a little bit about it. Um, my view is we've done the project, I talk about it, and then if things are supposed to happen, um, right. it'll happen. So I don't worry about that. And if people do see potential in these, um, I think they're exciting varieties. A lot of my seedling customers went all to dwarfs because they just got sick of tying up 10 foot tall indeterminates. And uh, this has really been a big help to people who just want to grow a nice plant on their deck. <laughs> so any question from the audience? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, so your question is how to identify the warrant? Okay. So the question is, uh, how do you find so many volunteers in the project? Any, what was the word? Right, I mean, is that your question? Volunteers. Yeah, how, how you find so oh, many? Oh, volunteers, yes. Um, mm -hmm. Sorry. Um, mm -hmm. So, God, I could talk a half hour just about this part. There are gardeners out there who are dying to make their gardens more interesting. So if you're on a website like um, Tomatoville, or if you're on, a, you know, if you're on Twitter, if you're on Instagram, if you're on Facebook, and you talk about your work, and you put out, uh, and you kind of tease people a little bit with saying how, you know, you sh clearly you're showing how much fun it is because you're so excited about the project. But then you get people start saying, I would love to help you out with that. And, you know, I'll say, well, just send me an email and we'll work things out. And just from the Instagram lives that I've done this in last year, 
each time I get to the end of the season, I've got 20 or 30 more people that I'm sending seeds off to. So you get volunteers by not making it intimidating, not putting a lot of rules in front of people, uh, making it feel like they can do it. If they can grow a tomato plant from seed, then they can grow it to maturity and save some seeds from it and send you a picture and describe it. And then the other um, carrot is if you find something great, your name will stick with that. The name will stick with that. And when that tomato ends up in a seed catalog, your name is there. So we ask anybody who reduces these, who um, releases these varieties to include the entire history. So, I mean, it, it sounds kind of corny, but it's something to tell your kids or grandkids someday. I took, you know, you really like this tomato we're growing in the yard? Well, I helped breed that. So I think there's lots of different ways to entice people. I think we're living in a time where people are looking for interesting, fun things to do to engage them that's positive. And helping in a breeding project, you don't really have to twist too many people's arms to dip their toes in the water. Okay, yeah, so there's one question from uh, the Zoom uh, from Gina. So she asked, can you talk about uh, the influences for your crop breeding methods? That's the first question. Mm. Right. The second question, to what extent do you take the inspiration from the participatory plant breeding methods? Um, so the first is around inferences of a project, meaning where does this sit? And I guess it would be where does, well, where does our project sit more, but more the type of project, the way we set it up. I think that using um, volunteers that are not trained geneticists and horticulturalists, but avid gardeners to take part in a project like this, increase scientific knowledge and engagement. I think that in a time where we're in such a polarized environment, being able to meet in, uh, in the common ground of a common goal or gardening. And uh, I think the way that I've seen this is since my book came out, since you're working on the project, I've given a lot of talks in a lot of places, physically and over Zoom. And the question of politics has never arisen once. And um, I mean, I clearly have my views. What I've decided to do is there's so much of it out there. Let's keep the gardening and playing with plants and developing variety space as, as uh, rid of that as possible. Now, I know once you escape that little bubble, you get into things like patents and, and profits and, and conglomerates and, and things like that. Um, but I don't, just in the same way that um, I don't like to get my talks to go too down the rat holes of what do you spray your plants with or, you know, what do you, do you think climate change is a hoax or not? I try to eliminate all that and just portray myself using my own values. And all people need to do is listen to my inter Instagram lives and they can get a pretty good sense of where I stand and all sorts of things. But, uh, but so far, as far as I can tell, I haven't alienated anyone. And I'm just trying to grow the pool of gardeners that want to do this sort of thing. Um, the second part of the talk, I didn't quite get exactly what you were going for. So could that be repeated? The second part of the question? I, I can just uh, I can ask my question out loud. Uh, sure. Hi, Virginia. Here. Hi. Hi. Thank you for your talk. It's great. Um, oh, thank you. Seems like a super fun project. I was just curious that, you know, um, I'm teaching a, one of the plant breeding classes and we'll talk a little bit about, a little bit about participatory plant breeding methods. Mm. And I was wondering, um, yeah, like if there were you know, other breeders using participatory methods that you took inspiration from when you were developing? <laughs> <laughs> well, so here's my answer to that. I'm one of these, I, I really am kind of Gregor Mendel type. So even, even though, you know, I have my PhD in chemistry and all that, and I understand science, I am thrilled by the process of discovery. So when we set upon this project, rather than read a lot of genetics books, you know, I have Barbara Lytle's, you know, big, big book, Barbara's a friend of mine, and I take out the magnifying every now and 
quest <coughs> every now and then and try to look at her diagram of all the genes and where they sit and which chromosomes. But I wanted to set upon a project with a totally fresh approach and no preconceptions of what anyone before us has done or even if they've done it. So I'm very much a, um, an explorer and a discoverer and am driven by kind of curiosity and discovery, I would say. So growing out F2s and looking at the color range and getting excited about what I'm seeing and then getting excited about what they're tasting um, was great. And so in a way I've positioned this project, uh, you know, once I write the book, people can look at our results and they'll be able to infer from that. But it really, this really truly was citizen science of me unplugging myself. Now I did use, you know, when you, so when you get a degree, you follow particular scientific methods, writing up experiments, having hypotheses, using controls. So I have no doubts that I used my disciplines learning and getting the degree, not only in doing the project, but I, you know, as people have said, I garden like a scientist. So you can't help that. But as much as you can compartmentalize into that, you know, turn that side of your brain off while you're appreciating just the wonders of growing and tasting things. If you can bring those two together, I think you get a powerful combination. So as you found with me, you can ask a very simple question and get a, a bit of an extended answer, but um, I'm still excited about all this. I've been gardening for 40 years and I'm just excited about gardens now as I was 40 years ago. So any of you folks there, use me as a resource to ask anything, anytime about how we set this up, where the problems lie, you know, anything I can do to help. Yeah, uh, yeah, so that more, one more question. Okay, okay good. Okay, thank you. I was intrigued by your straw bale gardening angle as well, <laughs> having done that myself for a couple of years now. And yeah, the tomatoes and the eggplants and the peppers seem to be the happiest in that meal. Yeah, but I was wondering if you see any G by E, are there any interactions where certain varieties do better on the bales as opposed to in soil or vice versa? Well, what a fantastic question. And this gets to um, this. You know, so I've, I've done this collaborative tomato course with Joe Lample, where he, he really is more of the the general gardening geek and I'm just the tomato geek, but we get a lot of questions about how much does how you grow a tomato affect not only its performance, but its flavor. And so I have the, I've been growing certain heirlooms for many, many years. So for example, Cherokee purple, I've grown in six different places since 1990. Um, JD Green sent it to me in 1990 and it's been in my garden ever since. Many others that I really love. And I've found whether I'm growing in a straw bale or a container, or a raised bed, or a garden, whether I'm growing them in the three different locations in Pennsylvania, or my two different locations in North Carolina. A great tomato has always ended up being a great tomato for me. So I've never grown Cherokee purple in any of the manners where they haven't tasted absolutely wonderful. So I think, I, I do think nutrients, soil, etc can and season it can can induce minor differences in performance of tomatoes flavor wise but i i've found in my experience i've grown four thousand different varieties and i've found a mediocre tomato is pretty mediocre no matter where and how i've grown it a superb tomato is pretty much superb so i think the genes tend to dominate but pressures and other things can come in and modify that a little bit um, Straw bale gardening, so I put two plants in a straw bale, which is the equivalent of two 20 gallon containers. And my average yield per plant has been 20 to 30 pounds. Uh, last year, it was in the 40 pound range. So it blew me away. Um, but you, I mean, you're turning your straw bales into essentially a wonderful compost pile and you're regularly watering it and feeding it. You're not dealing with clay. Um, you're not dealing with a bed that may have fusarium built up into it or, or nematodes. So for me, gardening in North Carolina, um, containers and straw bales have been my savior because at least I can get a little bit of a head start on diseases. I mean, septoria and early blight, of course, come in eventually, um, but I can get some of the more difficult to grow heirlooms to grow really well in straw bales. Yeah, I think we are running out of time. Uh, thank you again, Greg. It's a wonderful talk. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Good. I hope it met your needs, um, but it was great fun and I appreciate the invitation. Everybody have a wonderful career. <laughs> this for your breathing project.
Okay. Thank you. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.